people are... Is this working or no? No, it's not working. Just as well. Okay. People are still coming in, and we have found that we can get into Great Hall. Now, SOV is rehearsing in South Ballroom, but we've shut the doors and tried them. It's very little noise. I think we would all be better off down there. So will you move? Hmm. I guess people will keep coming in, so good evening. Uh, welcome to the evening lecture and film uh, showing. Huh? Oh. All right. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this evening's talk, picture show, answering question period by Helen and Scott Nearing, Living the Good Life. This uh, evening's presentation is uh, sponsored by the Iowa Perg Ag History, Graduate College, Family Environment, Environmental Studies, U.S. Farmers Association, and the Committee on Lectures funded by the GSB. Now, Scott and Helen Neering are, uh, have been on the campus for a symposium on the roots of agrarian uh, protest and are here tonight to discuss living the good life. It's very hard to summarize in a few sentences the life and experiences of the Nearings because if you just consider the fact that the first book that Scott Nearing published appeared in 1909. In a sense, his life and experiences summarize, at least from one point of view, the entire American history during the 20th century. And he's written 50. And he's written 50, thank you. <laughs> So I won't even attempt to do that. Very briefly, uh, Scott Nearing uh, had a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania and was launched into the academic world successfully until through a series of protests and investigations of such things as child labor, he was excluded from the academic world during the World War I period. By and for the draft. And forever after, right, thank you. <laughs> uh, by the Depression, uh, Helen and Scott Neary set out on a new existence, a new life, moved to Vermont, and from then later on to uh, Maine, doing what they consider living the good life. They published books on that and has become world famous in that respect. So. What I have to say is, amounts to very little compared to what they have to say, so I'd like to introduce you first to Helen Nearing, then Scott Nearing will speak. After that, we will be open to a question and answer period. At the end of that, approximately 9.30 or earlier, the picture on living the good life will be shown. Helen Nearing. I'm the tail that wags the dog, but I come first this time. Sometimes I come second and sometimes I come first. I'm the tail first. This meeting reminds me of two that Scott had, one in Mecca Temple in New York and the other in Madison Square Garden. And in both meetings, cat here? Oh, the other one. The other one. What's this, That's just a ball? <laughs> that works. It reminds me of uh, two meetings Scott had in New York. One was at Mecca Temple, where I attended, and the one before that was in Madison Square Garden, to which I did not go, never heard of it, didn't even know he existed then, so he must have been quite young. He, he couldn't, the chairman could not get into the Madison Square Garden talk. There were no loud speakers and things like this. What year was it, Scott? 1919, way back. So um, Scott was one of the speakers in Madison Square Garden. They had no broadcasting system like this. 
The chairman could not get in. Uh, somebody hustled up to Scott in an extemporary meeting like this and said, uh, will you be chairman and speak as well? He said, yes. So his voice had to carry in the whole of Madison Square Garden. It was a very disrupted meeting. It was uh, during the Russian Revolution, right? Why don't I get him to tell you? Well, anyway, um, he, he conducted the meeting and he said he, he went home and was just sweated because it was such turmoil in the meeting. He had to be the chairman, he had to be the speaker, and the chairman never was able to get through the ranks of people outside. So this is almost like that. But the Mecca Temple meeting I went to, Scott was debating Hamilton Fish Jr., who was a uh, New York senator. Representative. New York representative. You should listen to me because I need you. Um, <laughs> Anyway, we got to the meeting, and it was jammed outside. It was a big hall, big temple, and we couldn't get in. Hamilton Fish drove up with a limousine and a bodyguard. We got behind him, and he formed a sort of a wedge, and we crept in, in back of Hamilton Fish, into Scott's own meeting. I was at another meeting of Scott's, a very small one. I guess it was in Brooklyn, in Brooklyn, New York. And uh, we came to the meeting, and a girl was taking tickets, and she said, ticket, please. And instead of Scott saying, I'm the speaker, he paid his money, and in we went. <laughs> That's the kind of a chap he is. Well, uh, hmm. I was wondering, amongst the students who are here, what you think, what you're wondering about, as to what a good life is. Because ideas of good lives vary very much. I've seen some really lurid ads in the New Yorker and Esquire and other magazines like that that I don't read, but I see in airports and airplanes. And uh, they've got pictures of really dizzy gals and boys smoking and drinking and carousing, and it has on the top, Live the Good Life. Well, we thought we'd preempted the title, Live the good, Living the Good Life, but um, to many people, living the good life is carousing and um, all the rest of it. Drinking, having a good time, being utterly carefree. That's not uh, our idea at all. We. Um, follow more along with, let's say, Thoreau, or Gandhi, or Tolstoy. Thoreau lived in the woods for only a year and a half. We've been living in the woods for 50, 47 years. Thoreau lived in the woods for a year and a half. He built himself a little cabin, which I think you purists may tell me, I think cost him $12.81, or $18.21. Anyway, the cabin was small. It held a table, a chair, perhaps a chair for company, and a bedstead. And that was his idea of the simple life, of the good life. He didn't want to earn his living. He didn't want to spend his time in, in uh, mercantile affairs. He preferred to roam the meadows and uh, live in the woods. And that's more or less the way we would prefer to live. Gandhi died with as possessions a pair of sandals, a pair of spectacles, a loincloth, and a cane. This was the good life to him. The good life was a simple life. I might interject here before I get to Tolstoy, and before I forget it, a story about myself. I have just written a cookbook, and I don't like cooking, and I don't cook very well, but the publishers thought, ah, a Julia Child, I mean a Helen Nearing cookbook would sell well and do well. So they asked me to do one, I said, no, I would not write a cookbook, but I'd write an anti-cookbook. So they said, well, as long as cookbook's in the title, probably it'll, it'll, it'll sell. 
And then she wanted to have it called something, something, the good life. And really, when you've been living the good life for 47 years, you kind of would like another subject. So I said, what about calling it simple food for simple people? Oh, no, she said, look, people would be insulted if you call it uh, simple, simple people. I said, I don't say simple-minded people. I say simple food for simple people. No, she said, you kind of that alliteration in it. That wouldn't do at all. And she said, anyway, Helen, you're not very simple. You're pretty complex. So then I said, what about simple food for simple living? No, she said, it's got to be simple food for the good life. So there's the good life again. And, and, and September, October, out will come a book which is really simple by that frugal housewife. It'll be called Simple Food for the Good Life, I guess, unless I can get in a word again about simple food for simple people. Well, back to Tolstoy. Tolstoy was another of these great men who wanted to live a simple life. What it was to him a good life. He was wealthy, an account, and it was very difficult for him to uh, live in the uh, surroundings he was born and brought up in when he had gotten the grace to try to live the good life. He wanted to give away his estate. His family wouldn't have anything to do with that. So finally, poor old Tolstoy left his family and uh, got in a train and died, as most of you know, in a railway station alone and away from the wealth and grandeur of his family. So there are three, three great men who lived what they called the good life, and the good life was a simple one, was without possessions, without a lot of gadgets, and far away from civilization. Hmm, there's no light here. Our, our 47 years of living a good life has been far from cities. It was first 19 years in the woods of Vermont, and then when Vermont got too full of fancy skiers, they were right at our front door, we fled to Maine. And we left behind us a cluster, a clutter of stone buildings we had built, um, nine of them, and uh, we kissed goodbye to these nine buildings and went and found another lone, lost, neglected farm, which the first one had been. We found it on the banks of the Penobscot River. So now we don't live in the mountains and frequent the ocean on pilgrimage. We live by the ocean and we frequent the mountains on pilgrimage. And I really think I like to live better in the mountains. I like the high air, I like the crispness, I like the coldness, I like the winters. It went to 45 below most winters in Vermont. It only goes to 25 below in Maine. Well, that's something to put up with. Also, it's damp. We get, some, we get fog and so from the sea. And uh, all in all, I like mountain, mountain living. So we moved from Vermont to Maine, but we lived in just the same way, building our own stone buildings and uh, cutting our own wood and building our own houses, growing our own food, and living generally without clutter and gadgets. We have no telephone. I must say, occasionally I use the neighbors, so it's not really fair, but we have no telephone. Uh, we have no radio and we have no TV. We don't like the noises that come out of these machines. And we don't like their voices. They're the sort of people we wouldn't invite into our home anyway. And they're, they're talking about things which we don't particularly believe in. We think that the news that they uh, give is biased. And it's so short and clipped, it's over in one minute. And then you have a, have a uh, commercial. Friends of ours have little things you clip to turn off the commercial quick. But uh, then they make a mistake and they leave the commercial on and you, you don't hear the news. So all in all, we live quite happily without a television and without a radio and without a telephone. Another thing we do, which apparently is a little out of the ordinary in America, 
we keep healthy without a family doctor. Uh, since I have known Scott, he's never had, we've never had a family doctor. He's never been sick. He's never had to go to a doctor. Uh, he's broken his ribs a couple of times trying to carry too many sap buckets on his shoulder and I got my fingers caught in a buzz saw when I was taking wood off the saw, but that's not really going to a doctor, that's going to a surgeon and I salute surgeons, they're very clever. One time Scott got something in his eye, a leaf or grass, piece of grass, and it was very cleverly extricated. Well, that, that's a marvelous uh, thing to have around a surgeon but not a doctor who gives one pills. We've never taken a, an aspirin in our lives. I don't know what they taste like. I hope I never do. And I never have had a Coca-Cola in my life, except once we were in India and you couldn't get anything to drink at all and I had a drink of Coca-Cola and you can have it. I mean, <laughs> that, that, that was it as far as I was concerned. So we have no doctor. We. Um, work out our own period of time. We're not pushed by anybody unless he pushes me or I push him, but that's easy because I'm younger and stronger. So, <laughs> so there's no boss, well, no boss overhead, more or less. And uh, we live on a quiet back road. We have very few, uh, I almost said very few visitors, but I meant that our neighbors very rarely visit us. We have hundreds of visitors from young people, like the students here, who've read one or another of our books and who come up and want to help, in quotes. <laughs> and uh, most of them are very well-meaning. I shouldn't say we've had a lug amongst the thousands of people who've come to see us. There hardly has been a lug that you really wanted to get rid of. They uh, stay and help, and uh, I feed them. That's all we can do for them. We can't pay them. And most of them don't want pay anyway. They want to live there and learn. But the last two years, so many came. The last year I counted one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, and cross it off, one, two, three, four, five. There were, was it 3,500 or 2,500? doesn't matter, there were, it was in the thousands, and I counted them bodily, by body count. And that began to get a little thick because in the morning Scott would want to write, and there were people at the door who wanted to help. Uh, well, they couldn't help Scott write, so um, I had to find something for them to do. And after a while we, we said, look, come afternoons between three and five. I almost put a sign out saying, visitors welcome three to five, and I thought I shouldn't say that. So I said, we will see you three to five. So lots of young people are turning to our way of life, and uh, we think it's a, a marvelous idea, and we back them up every bit we can, and we had 700 acres in Vermont which we would gladly have shared with all and sundry who came, young or old, because who can use 700 acres unless they're Rockefeller and they keep it in cold freeze. We had that amount of acreage. And when nobody wanted to uh, come and help us at that time because uh, they thought we worked too hard. They wanted to lie in a hammock and uh, reminisce about a good life or ask me about and where were you born and how did you get into this and they wanted to talk about the good life but we wanted to live it and work it so the young people in our days in Vermont 30 years ago didn't avail themselves of the acreage we have so Scott gave it to the town when we left for a town forest he didn't want to profiteer from the money he had paid three dollars an acre for it by the time we left <coughs> Heavens, I don't know what we could have gotten, but the land is worth anywhere between five and 8,000 an acre now. So we avoided riches that way. And we went to Maine, and there we bought a farm of 140 acres. And now we only have 26 of those acres left because we let young people have the, have the land at what it cost us. So young people come and we say to them, we're glad to see you here, we'll help you any way we can, we'll tell you this, we'll tell you that, and read our books, but it's going to be hard for you because land is so expensive now. 
you won't be able to buy it. You better get together three or four couples and get the land that way and then learn how to work it. And we usually advise them to go to a spot they like in the country and hire themselves out to a farmer who knows the ropes and work for him as we did when we first went to Vermont. We didn't know how to sugar. We didn't know how to do a lot of things. So we tipped our hats to the nearest uh, amiable farmer and said, uh, can we help you during sugaring? Can we help you doing that? And uh, we were lucky when, if they took us on. And by the time we finished sugaring one year with Jack Lightfoot, we were able to start out on our own. And finally, uh, we wrote a book about it. So we learned a lot about maple sugaring. One thing you have to have inside yourself if you're going to live in the country and if you're going to homestead and if you're going to try to live that kind of a life away from towns and cities is you've got to have inner resources because you'll be very much alone except when strangers come and knock on the door. You must be happy to be alone. You must have inner resources. And fortunately, Scott has that in his own mind, and he's an economist, and he likes to read and write on economics and sociology and foreign affairs and that sort of thing. I was brought up a musician, so uh, any music any day will keep me happy, either playing it or listening to it. Scott is not musical, and uh, music could be, is not now, but could be my life. So that shows you that people even who are very different, he's not musical. He has an artistic garden, but he falls asleep if I take him to a concert. So, and when I have music on in the evening, he says, how long does this go on? <laughs> so I put up with him and uh, he puts up with me. Perhaps that's another thing that you should have if you start to homestead or live in the country. You should have a a congenial, companionable companion, and one who is competent, he is, and he's congenial and companionable, except he's not musical, poor thing. <laughs> so you, you should have someone who um, knows, he knows, he knows how to garden, he's, he's very competent, he's taught me what I know outdoors, and uh, I have stuck around with him for all these years, and he has stuck around with me, and I'm going to give him the floor now. Scott gets the stage. You want to help? Yeah. You're going to lift it up. Thank you, Helen, for the introduction. <clears throat> By my choice, I am a student of economics, sociology, history, and to a minor degree, also of agriculture. As a student, <coughs> as a student in these fields, I have spent a long life working with people, talking to people, listening to people, writing about people, and I continue my interest 
this evening for the purposes of my science, social science, this is a captive audience. <laughs> it's a captive audience made up primarily of students and their associates. And uh, as usual, I want to try something on them. So if you'll be patient and sit quite still, I'll go ahead. <clears throat> the human race, mankind, the human race has probably <clears throat> been on the earth for somewhere between two and four million years. Now this is not, this is partly guess, partly estimate, but it is also based on a great deal of evidence that has been accumulating. For a long time, people thought of themselves as newcomers on the earth. Today we recognize the fact that the human race <coughs> has had a relatively long period of residence on the earth. Most of that period has been spent as a period of, what shall we say, visiting or uh, observing or what not. And ultimately, sooner or later, the time must come when a visitor who is in a busy household says to his host and hostess, can I not lend a hand? Can I help you out? Can't I do something? And uh, as I see it, that is the position occupied today by mankind. The universe as we know it, our island universe, or the much more extensive cosmos, the universe as we know it is more or less experimental. It isn't final. One of the most characteristic and widespread features of our Earth, of our planetary system, of our island universe, and presumably of our cosmos, one of the characteristic features of our universe is change, C-H-A-N-G-E, not status. There's nothing that we know about the universe that is static, except theologically, and about that we make assumptions. But as far as the universe itself is concerned, it is dynamic, changing from the tiniest particles to the most extensive island universes changing constantly. Eventually, as I said, a time must be reached when the visitor, mankind on the earth, when the visitor says to his host, no names mentioned, can't I do something to help out? Can't I be of use? Changes are taking place continually. Behind every change, there's a force. Changes don't come automatically. They come systemically as a part of a process. 
We are at that position now. Uh, there are a number of reasons for supposing that this is our position, and I'll, I'll now mention one of these reasons. From the downfall, the disintegration of the Roman Empire about uh, a thousand years ago, a little more than that, down to the present time, the world, our world, our Western world particularly, the world was living through a period which we think of as a rather static period. Changes taking place very slowly, very gradually. Latterly, beginning with the Industrial Revolution of 1740, and the political revolutions of 1776 and 1783 and so following, the universe, the, our Earth passed into a period of revolution, industrial revolution, political revolution, social revolution, cultural revolution, uh, etc. And these changes came pounding in one after another in transportation, in communication, in industrial production, in agriculture, in forestry, in uh, transportation, etc. So that we are living in a period of rapid change that seems to be affecting particularly the part of the universe with which we are most immediately connected. Our planetary system about our Earth. My assumption is that these changes are not random, are not chance, but are determined, planned, foreseen, and guided changes. A book has recently appeared called Design or change? Change D or design? Change or design. Chance, chance or design, chance, pardon. Chance or design. If by chance, then mathematical probability determines the course of events. If design, then purpose more or less determines the course of events. Now I'm assuming that the changes which have been concentrated in the period between 1740 and 1980, that these changes are designed, that they have a purpose, that they have planned objectives, and that they are guided and directed. Uh, all of these are, uh, as you can see, 
getting pretty close to the margin of science and getting over into the, into the area of mythology or assumption or something of the kind. But I'm, for, for the purposes of our discussion this evening, I'm making these assumptions. And I assume, therefore, that those responsible for the direction of universal affairs could use help, could use assistance, could turn this way and that in an emergency. Like tis this evening when we had to change the hall at the last minute with the, the crowd already gathered, you see? That kind of thing happens all the time in the universe. And when things like this, when things like this happen, a little assistance by trained, experienced forces, people, beings, would be very useful and very important. When the human race was I was going to say launched, brought into being, conceived. When the human race was launched, those who projected this breath of, of activity, of vitality, this life breath, had in mind that the time might come when some of the products of this experimental development called the launching of the human race, the initiation of the human race. When this project would need active, trained, competent, experienced, and purposive assistance. And one of the characteristic features of the Great Revolution of 1740-1980, one of the characteristic features of this period, the tremendous number of inventions and discoveries and new combinations that have been called into being on the earth first in the West, then in other parts of the earth, on other parts of the earth, these tremendous changes requiring initiation, direction, expansion, and the like. One of the requirements was, is that more and more help was necessary, and that therefore, the Great Revolution was launched between 1740 and 1980 in order to sift out from the human race those individuals and groups who were more capable of giving assistance and direction, more trained in general promotion, for example. Those beings <coughs> could be given an opportunity to test out their capacity as directors and guiders and creative producers of a new society. There are other uh, aspects of this, this assumption that <coughs> to, to which I might refer, but I, I hesitate to go beyond this point. Uh, I, I never have attempted before with an audience of this size to say these things. Uh, nothing has happened so far as I can, as far as I can observe. <laughs> it's a sort of an adventure, you see, as far as I am concerned. Now, as far as you are concerned, it must be a little bit surprising particularly if you have a, 
<coughs> strict theological training or thick, strict theological background and think of the universe as a product, a unified product made in six days and finished on the seventh and never changed after that. If you have any of these the theological concepts, ta-ta. <laughs> but if you, are, if you are free of such lumber, uh, those of you who are still, let's say, less than 27 years of age, those of you who are at the, at the threshold of life, those of you particularly who have engineering skills or engineering ambitions or ideas or ideals, those of you who like to experiment, those of you who like to see changes, those of you who like to initiate, those of you who believe with uh, a famous uh, European professor in the doctrine siempre Mejor, always better, always better. Now, if you can guide your course in life by a concept which makes you leave the imperfect behind and reach forward to the more perfect, not to say the totally perfect, but the more perfect, then you have a progressive outlook on the universe and you have a progressive scheme of procedure. I uh, am saying these things tonight because this is a student audience. I was told that the audience this, this morning, this afternoon, would be an audience made up largely of non-student people, and that the audience this evening would be made up largely of people under 27 years of age, of student age. Uh, I assume that that's the case. And uh, I've now laid before you a proposition which deals first with the history of mankind, the, the background of mankind, and then with the problem of a changing background and a changing mankind, and then with the concept of changing productively and creatively rather than foolishly and destructively. Thank you very much, Scott Nearing and Helen Nearing. Uh, they have agreed that uh, they'd be more than willing to answer any questions or have, listen to any comments you might have on what they have said or what you have read about them um, at approximately, well, no later than 9.30, uh, the movie will be shown. So anytime up until then, if you have any questions or so on, please speak up. <laughs> 